we continue with our considerations on how to live with hope, a series of presentations out of the Word of God that speak to us about the experience of discipleship. And so I encourage you to pray with me as we invite God's Spirit to teach us in the next few moments. Holy Father, we come into your presence, thanking you for your word. As we continue to study it today, learning how we can live with hope, I pray that you would bless us. I pray that you would speak to us, guide our experience, deepen our walk with Jesus, and may today we be more like him because we have spent this time with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. One night after darkness had fallen, perhaps the moon was shining, there was a Jewish religious leader who walked quietly through the streets of Jerusalem and out into a more remote place outside the city to have a personal meeting with Jesus. Greetings were exchanged and an initial inquiry was made and to that inquiry of spiritual things, Jesus responded with words that we all know very well from John chapter 3, verse 3, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Strong words spoken by Jesus at the very opening of this conversation with a religious leader, and Nicodemus, seemingly confused as to what Jesus was talking about, questioned a little further. And to his inquiries, Jesus responded, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. The wind blows where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh. And whither it goeth, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Jesus was here providing a description of the experience that each and every one who has been converted by the Spirit of God goes through. The work of the Holy Spirit upon the life is not compared to something big and outright and obvious and visible and traceable, but rather Jesus compares the experience of conversion to the wind, the working of the Holy Spirit upon the human heart to the breeze that blows by. Jesus says you can't tell where it's coming from and you're not quite sure where it's going, but its effects can be felt. In that beautiful book, Steps to Christ, page 56, it says this, A person may not be able to tell the exact time or place or trace all the chain of circumstances in their process of conversion, but this does not prove him to be unconverted. Pause there for just a moment. Sometimes in our Christian culture today, we recognize that people oftentimes state that there was a day and an hour and a specific appeal at a specific altar where they walked forward and that was the moment of their conversion. And for some, it is traceable that way. But the tr if the truth is fully known and understood, the process of our conversion has never been an instantaneous moment. It has been the patient working of the Spirit of God on a person's heart and life over a period of time through the experiences of one's life and through the ins and the outs and the ups and the downs of day-to-day -day living. And finally, there comes a point where the individual, after having heard the call of God, responds... And so rightly so, Sister White makes in this statement, the, the, gives us the consideration that maybe you're one of those. Maybe you cannot fully trace it, the, the steps of your conversion. You don't know exactly where God began with you. You don't know exactly where it was that your heart began to open to God's voice. But the statement that she makes is for our encouragement. Because you may not be able to point back to a date and an hour of your conversion, she says, let it not be confusing to you. That does not mean that you have not been converted. For some, it is very, uh, the, the experience has been very much centered upon a specific event, but for others, it has been a process. I continue the statement. Like the wind which is invisible, Yet the effects of which are plainly seen and felt is the Spirit of God in its work upon the human heart. 
While the work of the Spirit is silent and imperceptible, its effects are manifest. If the heart has been renewed by the Spirit of God, the life will bear witness to that fact. Now, in our past studies over the last number of weeks and, and months that we have been studying in our series of How to Live with Hope, we have determined from Scripture that we as human beings are powerless to be able to change our hearts or to bring ourselves by ourselves into harmony with God. However, the power and the grace of God can do it. And for many of us, that has been our experience. We have been led by the grace of God. We know our hearts have been changed, and we know our experience has been renewed. But we know that we didn't do it because we never could have. But God has accomplished it. And today, we're going to consider that if, uh, not if such a change is possible, because we've already studied that from God's Word, but I want to consider with you today what such a change affects in our lives. What does this change look like? What evidence is there in our lives that the grace of God, the grace of Christ, has truly found residence within us? Paul writes clearly in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. You know this text probably by memory. It says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new what? He is a new creature. Behold, I'm sorry, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So how is that newness considered? How is that judged? How is this newness of experience recognized and how is it recognizable in the life of a Christian? The truth is that our lives will reveal whether or not the grace of Christ is dwelling within us. A change is going to be seen in our character, in our habits, in our pursuits each and every day in our lives. The former life and the new life in Christ will be clearly distinguished one from another by the actions and the thoughts and the words that are now coming forth from us. If Christ has the heart, then the thoughts, the love, and the affections, the energies, and truly all we have will be consecrated to Him. And then our lives will reflect the image of Christ, the Spirit, the will, the love of God will shine through. Take your Bibles with me to the book of Ezekiel in the Old Testament. Probably not a book you hear many passages quoted from in sermons. Oftentimes the book of Ezekiel is considered to be a somewhat of a confusing book, a book that many don't spend too much time on, but I want to let you know that the gospel message and God's grace is clearly found in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 11, looking at 19 and 20. Notice God's word. He says, and I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within them, and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh, and I will give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them. And then in, in wording that is very familiar to readers of the book of Revelation, the last chapters, God says, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. That new heart, that new spirit that God has promised to put within us, to put within that individual, you and me, by the grace of God, who surrenders to Christ, will lead us in a new direction. The old heart, the old spirit, plagued by selfishness, dedicated to serving the ways of sin, is gone and replaced by a new heart and a new spirit that love the Lord and long to walk in the ways and in the commands of God. Paul referred to this experience in the book of Romans chapter 6 as walking in newness of life. And in that newness of life, in verse 6 of Romans 6, he says, it is so that henceforth we should not serve sin. It's a new life so that we won't serve sin. The old life, obviously, then, has been a life of service to sin. And Christ, when He comes in, seeks to put us on a new road, and He says that newness of life, that new life in Jesus, is a life that now will not be the servant of sin. The life that we have left, the life that we have put to death with Jesus on the cross, is a life that has had distinct activities. Take your Bibles over to the book of Galatians chapter 5. 
Galatians chapter 5, we're going to take a look at verses 16 and 17. And these passages outline the so-called works of the flesh that are a part of the unconverted, unsurrendered hearts of the old life. These works of the flesh, as Paul lists them, are these. Notice Galatians 5. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 5, looking at verses 19 and 20. Galatians 5, 19 and 20. Adultery fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, continuing in verse 21, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and the such like. And then Paul adds commentary. He says, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. I want you to notice the parallel of this passage with what Jesus has said in John chapter 3. Jesus said to Nicodemus, except you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Here, Paul says, anyone who is practicing these things will not enter the kingdom of God. The connection between these two passages is that we understand what it means to not be born again. What is the life of the non-born-again individual? This is the life right here in Galatians chapter 5. The person who is born again then is someone who is no longer living the, out, the, the life that is depicted and described in all of these works of the flesh. Now these are the things that the converted Christian has chosen to leave behind. Notice I said chosen to leave behind. Our decision for Christ is a choice that we have to make. It is not something that is forced upon us. It is not something we are born into. It is not something that someone else can do and give to us by proxy. It is our choice and our decision. And the individual who chooses to be converted by the grace of God has made the choice that this life, what you read in Galatians 5 verses 19 to 21, is the life that they want to be their past not their present and their future. And so the individual who has chosen to avoid and resist these things in the new life of Christ recognizes that there cannot be a vacuum. You can't give away that which is wrong and then remain with nothing. Jesus doesn't want us to remain with nothing. He actually counsels against that concept in the gospel that when you get rid of the demon that you have, you've got to be filled with something good. What is that that we should be filled with? Who else but the Spirit of God? When we turn our backs in repentance on the works of the flesh, the Spirit of God comes into us, and those sinful works are replaced by what Galatians in the next two verse, verses call the fruit of the Spirit. Notice verse 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, and Paul then adds the commentary, against such there is no law. Nothing against any of these things. God's kingdom will be filled with those who demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit, those whom the Spirit of God has come into so that God's will and His, and His way can be manifest in the world. I want you to notice that none of these terms are passive terms. All of them involve some action. All of them involve some aspect of doing. You cannot love without loving in action. You cannot be joyful without the expression of that joy being evident. You cannot be long-suffering without the evidence of that patience being clearly distinguished. Those who become new creatures in Jesus Christ are no longer going to fashion themselves after the ways of the world, no longer going to fashion themselves according to the former lusts and the former practices here called the works of the flesh. But by the faith of the Son of God, they will follow in Jesus' steps and their character being changed and molded by God will reflect the character of of Jesus. The things that they once loved, they now hate. And the things which we once hated, we now love. Because Jesus gives us 
a new heart. The great evidence of the transforming power of Christ in the life and in the heart of a person is the contrast of what they are now compared to what they were then. Or we can say it the other way, the contrast seen between what we used to be and what God has made us. And the experience of this new heart demonstrated in the life becomes the test of our discipleship. Jesus said, you will know them by their... We're being compared to trees, aren't we? We're being compared to trees growing and developing through the growing season to finally demonstrate its fruit after the blossom. You'll know them by their fruits. You'll know if it's an apple tree because it will bear what? You'll know it's an orange tree if it bears oranges. You'll know it's a grapevine if it bears grapes. You'll know it's an olive tree if it bears olives. The tree is determined and, the, and its identity is clearly distinguished by the fruit that it bears. And Jesus says these are the same evidences in the life of the Christian. The fruit of our lives reveal the nature of our experience just as the fruit of a tree reveals its nature and its identity. John the Baptist, when he was calling people to repentance there around the, er the area of the Jordan River, very clearly made a statement. And the statement was this. He said to those people seeking conversion, bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance. Luke chapter 3 verse 8. In Christ, what are those fruits worthy of repentance? The experience of the one in Christ is going to be that the proud, the self-assertive become meek and lowly in heart just like Jesus. The vain and the arrogant are going to become serious and they're going to become unobtrusive. The drunken will become sober and the reckless and the wasteful will become pure and will become true. The vain customs and the fashions of the world are going to be laid aside and Christians with this new life of Christ within them will seek the adorning of spirit, of heart, which in the, value of, in the sight of God is of great value that meek and quiet spirit. When we are born again, when our hearts have been renewed by the grace of Christ, there will be certain directions that we will want to go, and they're going to differ from the ways that we used to go, and they're going to differ from the things that we used to do and the things that we used to want. Our outward actions are the fruit on the tree, and those fruits have come forth motivated by the new life that is of Christ within us. We're told... In that book, Steps to Christ, a few pages further on in page 59, that there is no evidence of genuine repentance unless it works reformation. And that's the consideration that we're talking about. The life must change for one to truly understand, to one to truly say that he has been converted or she has been converted. The life will bear testimony. What testimony? What does that reformation look like? Certainly repentance calls for a reformation of sinful ways and the directions that have been previously followed. That reformation is going to lead to two things primarily, among others, but two primary things, making restoration and working toward reconciliation. A couple of biblical references may help us to understand. In the book of Luke chapter 19, we have the story of a man named Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus was ministered to by Jesus. He was that short little man who climbed up in the sycamore tree, as the song says, for the Lord he wanted to see. And on the day that the Lord passed by, he looked up in that tree. And our children know the words well. What did, Zacche what did Zacchaeus hear? The words of Jesus. Zacchaeus, come down because I'm going to your house today. And Zacchaeus was so moved that Jesus, this great rabbi, this great teacher of spiritual truth and the Word of God, would pay any attention to him. He came down and his heart was changed. And as they went on their way to Zacchaeus' house that day, Zacchaeus made a confession, Lord, I'm going to do some new things in my life. I'm going to change my ways. Behold, half of my goods I'm going to give to the poor. I don't need them anymore. I used to find refuge and I used to find hope and I used to find joy in things of this world, but now I've got you and I don't need these things anymore. I'm going to give half of my goods to, to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man, he said, by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Restoration of that which has been taken in whatever sense of the word is an evidence of repentance. It's an evidence of that reformation. 
It's the goal and the aim of the newly converted believer in Christ. Just as Jack Zacchaeus pledged to restore, so me, we also must pledge to restore. I don't know what it is that we might have taken in our pre-Christ days. It might have been someone's physical things. It might have been their possessions or their money. God says the, the Christians seeking this reformation, seeking this new life will restore. But maybe it wasn't physical, tangible things that you took away. Maybe it was something else. Maybe someone's reputation. Maybe it was someone's honor. Maybe it was someone's dignity. God calls us to work for restoration of those things in those lives. Secondly, a text in Matthew chapter 5, that Sermon on the Mount in verse 23 and 24, texts that oftentimes challenge us because of our humanity. Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 and 24 say this, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, let me pause there for a moment. What is the context? Some would say offering. Maybe so. Where does the offering happen? At church. The point is, it's a context of worship. It's a context of worship. If you're coming to the altar with your gift for the Lord, this is an aspect of worship. He says, if you bring your gift to the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift reconciliation and I want to I want to talk to the church of God today because this is not something that applies just to unbelievers this is something that applies to us reconciliation among people is the, an essential outworking of the grace of Christ in the life the word I used was essential we cannot expect to go through this Christian experience with the painted on smile and with the expectation that when we get to heaven, Jesus is going to make it all good and the person that I can't stand to see here right now might be my neighbor in heaven and I'm just going to expect it'll all be fine there. Jesus tells us that the only thing we take to heaven from earth is our character and that character needs to be molded, that character needs to be fashioned and a part of that molding and fashioning is the process of going through some difficult things here. Some of those difficulties involve reconciliation with those that we don't like. Some of those circumstances involve reconciling when maybe we've done something and someone has been injured. Reconciliation, according to this passage, also implies that you as the believer, even if you haven't been the one to do the wrong, but you know someone has got something against you, it is your responsibility to go. And the church of God oftentimes misses this. We come to worship. We come with our gift. And we have left reconciliation on the sidelines. We come bearing the offering. We come bearing the service. And reconciliation is covered in dust somewhere. But notice what Jesus says in his word. He instructs you. He instructs me that if we want to worship and yet we haven't been reconciled, halt the worship and go and be reconciled. That's how important it is in the life of the believer and in the life of the church. The absence of reconciliation creates tension. Tension brings disputes. Disputes create other unnecessary feelings among the people of God. And allow me to ask a question which is rhetorical in nature. How much mission and how much advancement of the gospel will happen among a people if there are things that are unreconciled, where there is tension, where there is discord, where there's disunity? How much advancement will be made? You know the answer. I know the answer. Could it be that in many places, places which can remain unnamed, they may be close or they may be far, it appears that the church of God languishes. Could it be? It is because the people of God have not been reconciled. 
Worship flows from a heart that is right with God, and yet we cannot be truly right with and at peace with God if we are not right with and at peace with others. Be reconciled with your brother or your sister. Maybe it's not a, f- a, a family relationship. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a, it's a, a work acquaintance. Maybe it's a, a school acquaintance. Maybe it's a church ministry acquaintance. Whatever it is, be reconciled. To seek this against the pressure of pride one of the great plagues of the people of God. Against the pressures of pride, against the pressures of embarrassment, to seek this reconciliation will be evidence of the presence of Jesus in the life. Of course, neither restoration nor reconciliation could be possible without love. We as erring, sinful human beings, when we come to Christ and we we begin to partake of His pardoning grace of our sins, love springs up in our hearts. It's the natural outflow of accepting Christ. Love will come into the life. And by this love, our duties, our obligations to Christ and to others become a delight to us and a pleasure to perform. It's not about the action. It's about Christ. And whatever Christ wants, we will do. Whatever Christ calls us to be, we will be, we'll want to be. Because His love inspires love within our own hearts. The source of that love is God. John wrote in his epistle, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knows God. God is love. Behold, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. If we love one another, God dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us. Love doesn't come from an unconsecrated heart. Love doesn't come out of a heart that is not surrendered to Christ, but love comes from God. And when God is in the heart, when Christ is in the heart, love can be in that heart as well. We are able to love because God first loved and because God is love. And in that heart renewed by divine grace, love will be the principle of action. It modifies the character. It governs our impulses, it will control our passions, it will subdue enmity and conflict, it will deepen our affections. That love will have not only a beautiful influence upon our own individual personal life, but a love such as that in your heart and mine will influence and bless those around us. How is love manifested? How is it shown to God and to others? Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, we know this text well, don't we? If you love me, keep my commandments. He elaborated in chapter 15, verses 10 to 11. He says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Jesus is clear. The experience of loving obedience to him is not an experience absent of joy. Jesus actually says that the way to experience true Christ-filled joy is through obedience. Our love for God, he says, will lead us to obey him, following the commands of Christ, being and living obedient to him in all things means honoring and respecting his law, all of it. We often emphasize it, I wonder, and only God will know how often we live it. And faithfully serving those whom Christ has given his life for, all of them. There are no exclusions. There's no one people group better than another. There's no one that God has called us to serve to the absence or to the exemption of another group. God has called us to be of service to all his people. This is following the command of Christ. God's Ten Commandments are clearly understandable. We can read the Ten Commandments. We know what they say. We emphasize the practical aspects of those Ten Commandments on a regular basis. They constitute the will of God in our lives today. The principles, though, contained within those Ten Commands embody the very character of God, and they reveal God's great and holy desires for us in our lives. A look at the Ten Commandments is not only telling us what we can and cannot do. A look at the Ten Commandments, recognizing them as God's wishes for us. Show us how God feels about us, what God wants our experience to be, and the depth of that experience. Following the great summary of the law that Jesus gave, you know that summary which says love for God and love for humanity, that summary 
we know that the outworking of love and obedience to God blesses humanity. When I am faithful to God in my life and I honor and keep His commandments, it leads me to be faithful to other people. It leads me to be kind and blessing to other people. In John chapter 21, Jesus there after the resurrection walking on the seashore with Peter, He says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Love being the key central question. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. You know I love you. And Jesus gave him a task related to that love. What was the task? Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs, he was told. In Matthew chapter 25, the parable of the sheep and the goats, the king recognizes all of the blessed ministry that has been done to the hungry, to the thirsty, to the strangers, to the naked, to the lonely, to the imprisoned, and having been all done as unto whom? Himself, he said. And that was worthy of blessing and reward. It was based upon love. Essentially what we are saying today, what God's Word is teaching is that obedience to God, faithfulness to Him, to His will, to His way, to His Word, is the outworking of L-O-V-E. Faithfulness to God is the outworking of love. Love is the basis for obedience to God. Love that God Himself provides to us and sheds abroad in our hearts. John wrote, he that says he abides in him also ought himself to walk even as he, Jesus, walked. We need to avoid the two great errors. I'm not going to spend any time on these, but just a reminder, the two great errors, the first error that must be avoided is that we can do something, is the belief that we can do something to bring ourselves into harmony with God. To try to do something to make yourself acceptable to God is attempting an impossibility. It cannot be done. We only are brought into harmony with God because of Jesus. The other great error is that we fall into the other ditch. And the other ditch says, because of such a marvelous and full and deep and wonderful grace of God, I can sit back and relax and there's nothing I need to do. And that also is an error. Because God very clearly tells us through the writings of the Apostle Paul that after we accept the grace of God, which we cannot work for, and receive the salvation of God, which we cannot earn, that we, according to Ephesians 2.10, are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And so we recognize in one passage of Scripture, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10, that the two errors are clearly defined, and they are easily avoidable by accepting the teaching of the gospel. We can't do anything to earn favor or forgiveness from God, but our favor from God and the grace that we've, been, that we've received from Him, the forgiveness we've gained from Him, does not cause us to be idle. In the love of God, through the grace of God, we go forward in faith and with deeds of righteousness which stem from the grace of God in our hearts, those, that faith and those deeds must work together. Our profession, not our vocation, but our profession, our confession, and our actions must be in harmony one with another. That will be evidence that our profession is true. That will be a test of our discipleship. When God made a covenant promise to Israel, He made it to His people throughout all time. And in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16, His covenant is said this way, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws, my what? I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. There's God's grace, grace that leads to forgiveness. But in the very same promise of God, He says, as I forgive you, I am also giving you my law. There's actions in the Christian life. There are deeds to be done. There are works to be done, not to gain the favor of God, but because we have gained the favor of God and seek to live in response to His love. Obedience in my life and yours is not supposed to be merely an outward compliance to a list of rules and regulations. Obedience is the service of love. Obedience is the outworking of the great principle of love. Doesn't it make sense that if our hearts are renewed in the likeness of God, 
And if the divine love is implanted in our soul, that the law of God will be carried out in the life? When the principle of love is implanted in our hearts, when the law is written on our hearts and our minds, do we not think that it will shape our lives? Of course it will. And thus, obedience, which is the service and allegiance of love, is the true sign of our discipleship. The verifiable evidence that the grace of Christ received in the heart manifested in action to love in love to God and His children. It is faith and faith only that makes it possible for us as receivers of the grace of God to render obedience to the Lord and to His commands. I can't obey and you can't obey unless you are a child of faith. You'll never be able to obey on your own. It is only as God works within us. He comes within us by faith. It is only by that faith then that we will be able to go forward living what Christ desires us to live. The central aspect of the disciple's life is faith. Faith to receive Christ's grace. Faith to render the service and the allegiance of love. These fruits of obedience in the life reveal that Christ is in the life. They are the fruit of faith and the labor of love, according to Paul. It is God's desire, God's clear desire in your life and my life that we would bear fruit. Jesus said in John 15, verse 16, You have not chosen me. I have chosen you. And ordain you, Jesus says, that you should go and bring forth fruit, not just temporary fruit, but he says fruit that should remain. The experience of our lives Jesus does not, that Jesus gives us is not just something that comes for a moment and then withers away. When Christ comes within and when grace has truly been received and daily we are surrendering to the will of Christ, The fruit will remain. What fruit are we talking about? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. The obedience to God's commands, love to God, love to our fellow humanity, going out in service, obedience, the service and the allegiance of love. This is the fruit that grows on the tree which is planted and growing in Christ Jesus. Peter says that when we have these things in our lives, we won't be barren or unfruitful. We will grow in Christ. And brothers and sisters, in this modern age, the call to be disciples, whether it is now or whether it was in an age in past history, is a call to be distinct. It's a call to be different from the world. One Bible passage that you're very familiar with, I know, calls you to be, what's that P word that we like to say? Peculiar. Sometimes we scratch our heads and say, do I really want to be weird? No, it's not about being weird. It's not about being strange. God doesn't call us to be strange and weird. What he calls us to be is different, distinct from that which is normal in the world. What is the norm of the world? The norm of the world is selfishness. It's a lack of love. It's coldness. But to be distinct, to be different, to be the people of God is to be selfless, self-denying, caring, kind, compassionate, patient, merciful, peaceable, and loving. We are to live this way because our great example, Jesus Christ, has lived this way, and we are called to follow In his steps. Psalm 85, 13 says, Righteousness shall go before him, and he shall set us in the way of his steps. To follow in the steps of Jesus is true discipleship. To walk as Christ walked is true obedience. To live as Christ lived is true discipleship. To love as Christ loved is true love. Is it possible? It is possible. It's not possible by our own strength. 
It's not possible by our own efforts or our own power. Our natures are fallen. We cannot make ourselves righteous. We are sinful. We're unholy. We can't perfectly obey the law of God. But Christ has made a way of escape for us, His Word says. He lived on earth and He faced trials and temptations just like we have to meet. He lived a sinless life. He died a perfect death. And He offers to take our sins upon Himself and to give us His righteousness. He offers to give us His power. And if we give ourselves to Him, if we accept Him as our Savior, then sinful as your life may have been, for His sake, you are counted righteous. And Christ's character stands in your place, in the place of your character, and in the place of your sin. And you are accepted before God just as if you had not sinned. Paul said of his experience, which is to be our experience, and it was so beautifully read for us by one of our children this morning, Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. That's right. Not I. Not you. But Christ liveth in, can I change the scripture in this one word to make it plural? Christ lives in us. Not just me, not just one, but all of us. This is the experience of the body of Christ. Christ lives in us, and the life which we now live in the flesh, we're still here. We're still flesh and bones. It's still a sinful world, but the life we experience right now, we live by the faith of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us, Paul says. In the life of discipleship, we follow Christ. We allow Christ to live His life again through, in us through the Holy Spirit. And if there are occasions, listen carefully as we close. If there are occasions when somehow, for some reason, your eyes drift off of Jesus as Peter's did as he was walking on water, and you begin to sink, and you fall down into the cold and cruel waves... Remember the promise that the Apostle John gave us in 1 John 2, 1 when he said, Little children, I write these things unto you that you sin not. There's the goal. There's the objective that we sin not, that we stay so united, so close to Jesus that we choose not to fall. But if there's something that should distract us, if something should take our attention off of Jesus for even just a moment, John says, If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. Our advocate is on our side. That's what it means to be an advocate. He's able to save to the uttermost those that come to God by him, Hebrews tells us, seeing that he ever lives to make. You tell me, what is he making? Intercession for us. And because of that, his pledge to represent us and to intercede for us, we can be, according to Philippians 1, 6, confident. What can we be? confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. How is it going to be done? By God working in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure, as long as we maintain our connection with him by faith and continually surrender our wills to him. Discipleship is the work of God in the life of the believer who is committed to Christ. The test of that work, the evidence of that work being done is the fruit born on the tree. And when the heart is Christ's, the fruit that comes forth in the life will reflect Christ's ownership and His presence. His is the work. His is the love. His is the grace. His is the result. We have nothing in which we can boast at all. No grounds for personal pride, for arrogance, or for self-exaltation at all. Our only boast is in Christ Jesus. Without Him, we have nothing. With Him, we have all things, the Scripture tells us. Apart from Him, we are hopeless. But with Him, we have full hope and assurance. Our only hope is in Jesus Christ. And Christ has said to assure us The Father Himself loves you. 
He desires your restoration. He desires to see His character perfected in your life. He desires your salvation. So distrust yourself, but trust in Him, because He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the coming of Jesus Christ. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who called you, who also will do it. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, your word testifies that you are faithful. And in place of our unfaithfulness, you have provided your faithfulness. In place of our unrighteousness, you have provided your righteousness. In place of our unloveliness, you have provided us your loveliness and your love. And today, Lord, may our discipleship be be tested by there being visible evidence of your presence in our lives. Let us not seek for show. Let us not serve pride and selfishness. But Father, may we humbly respond to you. And may you, through the Holy Spirit, grow and develop the fruits that you wish to be in our lives. May we give to you and to fellow humanity the service and the allegiance of love, honoring you and obeying you, and loving and serving those whom you love. Bless us, Lord, as we go forth from this place today. May we be deepened in our walk with Jesus, growing ever more closely as his disciples is our prayer in his name. Amen.